All right, welcome to the show, everyone. My guest today is Thomas Stanford. In 2017, Thomas and his partner, Alex, were unhappy in their jobs and looking to start a business on the side. After a few attempts that went nowhere, Alex saw a gap in the market when she couldn't find a yearly planner that was exactly what she wanted, and this frustration led to St. Belford. St. Belford is a brand that looks to provide its customers with the tools they need to improve their lifestyle, the main product being the yearly curation diary. What started as a $15,000 investment out of their Melbourne apartment grew to a healthy six-figure business within 18 months of conception, and they now support various mental health initiatives such as Beyond Blue and Are You OK? I want to bring Thomas on the show to find out how he launched St. Belford, how he grew it to Beyond Six Figures, and where he plans to take the business next. So, Thomas, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, James. Of course. So I want to get a little bit of a sense of your, your background and your story before you were doing St. Belford. So I was wondering if you could just tell us what were you doing for work before this whole journey started? Yeah, sure. And just be completely transparent with everyone. I do have notes. So I'm going to cheat a little bit. But um, <laughs> what I was doing before St. Belford, I was working in retail and my partner, who's my life partner and partner in business, Alex, she was working in marketing in a, for a marketing firm and as you mentioned in the intro we were both in jobs which we really didn't like and i guess saint belford was born from us being in jobs we don't like alex having some health issues which we can talk about and then her finding a gap in the market which you mentioned as well but um, yeah. In terms of myself, I was going through a range of jobs from retail to photography to I was a removalist at one point. I was a technician. So just cycling through and nothing really excited me like entrepreneurship did. Mm. So I don't know if it's the same about you, but like podcasts really got me into entrepreneurship when podcasts first started blowing up like four or five years ago. And there's all this awesome free content out there. And that was super inspiring for me and mm. I was devouring this information but it was like what am I going to do with it that was a big question for a couple of years yeah. but thankfully you, were... you found the answer yeah and we'll definitely get into St. Belfin in a second but you, you did try to start a few businesses before that didn't you on the side you I think you had a an online store selling a few different things like some music samples and can you talk about some of those, or maybe it was just the one, but can you talk about that project before St. Belford? Yeah, it was just the one. So I was doing music samples, making electronic music for music producers and those kind of things, and thought it'd be a great idea to sell some samples that I was making on the side, which are basically just drum loops and those kind of things which producers use to make beats, and that was a great introduction into the world of e-commerce and how everything works online, but it ultimately failed because I didn't sell one pack. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I really love the yeah. idea of selling digital products because you can make it once and sell it an unlimited amount of times, which is awesome. And I still think digital products are a really, really good way to go if you've got something unique to offer, but obviously mine weren't very unique. And I knew nothing about marketing and driving traffic to websites. So that ultimately yeah. failed, but that was a good learning curve into the world of e-commerce, into the world of Shopify. Um, and I guess it was a good starting point, even though, yeah. because I mean, there was no capital lost or anything like that. I maybe lost a couple hundred dollars in Shopify fees and a lot of time, but it's all in learning. That's it. I think that's the key thing. It's, it's rarely your first project or your first attempt that is going to be the one that sticks long term so it's almost like you have to go through those first ideally you want to minimize the amount of failures or, or things you have to go through before you get to that one that works but um you you kind of have to accept it as as part of the the game i guess so um yeah it's, it's good to to look back on that and i think you're yep and your partner Alex as well had a had a bit of a blog that she was trying to get off the ground and and that as well didn't quite take off. So you both were were trying to start something on the side and try a few different things and they weren't necessarily working, but you were sort of gathering learnings and you could then take that forward into your next projects. So that kind of led to to St. Belford. So I was wondering if you could just tell the story of 
where that idea actually came from for St. Belford? Yeah, absolutely. So as I mentioned briefly at the start, there were three core elements which started St. Belford. The first being us in jobs which we didn't like, which is the typical entrepreneur story, I guess you could say. The second was Alex suffered some severe burnout from her corporate job. So the term burnout gets thrown around a lot and can manifest in all different shapes and sizes. But for her, it was a symptom called gastritis, which is stomach lining inflammation or something along those lines. And essentially, it caused this really bad stomach pain. You couldn't stomach food, um, just in severe pain. And all this was related from stress, which we mm. kind of blew us away um, when the doctor diagnosed this. So that was a big eye opener because she was working really hard at a job and she was very good at her job. But um, I guess it was a turning point for her as mm. to figure out what's important in life and what to focus on. And at the time we weren't exercising much. We weren't really taking our mental health into consideration. And then she took some time off work. And during this time, it was at the start of 2017, we were looking for a planner for the year or a diary and shopping around South Melbourne. And we couldn't find anything that we liked that was really standing out to us. And at the time, Alex mentioned, oh, I should probably just make my own. It would be a lot easier than buying something that I don't like. And we didn't think anything of that comment. It was just a passing comment. And a couple of weeks later, it was, I was really inspired by one of my work colleagues who'd opened up an online store and was absolutely killing it. And I thought, That's, I really want to do this. And I kind of remembered the light bulb went off about the planner. I thought that would be a great product to test first mm. at least um, because it's cheap enough to make um, and it's not too much, not like you're designing a phone or something which requires a lot of technical knowledge to design. You just need to design some you know, nice PDFs and whatnot and get a supplier. And So that was the idea and we really thought about it for a good month. It was a good four weeks we put in thought and – figured out pros and cons and all the things that could go wrong and all the things that could go right. And it was around the end of March, 2017, where we thought we'd go for it. Mm, that's cool. It's a, it seems to be a common, common story where someone is trying to find something for themselves and, and it's a pain or a problem that they're facing, but they can't find a solution for it in the market. And then it's kind of that, in a way, light bulb moment where you realize why don't I be the one who actually makes this? So I love that. So what was the, how did you go through the process of getting that first batch of planners actually manufactured? Um, I'm assuming you went through like a Chinese supplier, maybe Alibaba. Um, can you just walk us through like how that worked, how you got it all set up and any, any challenges with that first batch? Yeah, absolutely. It's important to note that once we had the idea, we still had absolutely zero idea about the industry, about how books were made, about anything like that, about specific terms. Um, so we were really, really novice in this area. And the first step was just educating ourselves about how a book was made for starters, what we wanted in terms of a design, and then going from there. So finding the supplier was definitely the hardest task for the first year. So we hit up, there was around 50 different suppliers and all those were based in Australia because we didn't want the hassle of going offshore and having to deal with importing and customs and those kind of things. We thought we'd pay an extra higher price for Australia and not have the headache of going overseas. And so out of the 50 we hit up, one said yes and one was a perfect fit so we went with them which was cool and so they're made in australia or the the first batch they weren't he actually offshored them um but he owns a company who does printing in australia and does uh outsourcing to offshore as well so the beauty of that was uh that company helped us through the whole process and imported it for us and we didn't really have to do 
um, much in terms of that side of things. But that was the hardest part of running a printer. And yeah, it all worked out, thankfully. <laughs> That's good. And yeah, I know exactly what you mean about getting educated on the process because I've actually got some some planners made up myself, um, manufactured, and they start asking you all these questions like, what sort of binding do you want? Do you want lay flat binding or do you want whatever? And then you're like, uh, I don't even know what that is. <laughs> what's, what's the difference? So you have to Google and find out what all the different types are and what page color do you need and all these crazy things you never even thought existed. So I totally get that. And it was good that you were able to find someone to, to help you through that process. So that's awesome. And so you didn't actually pre-sell these planners. So it, what sort of investment did you have to to put in to get this first run of planners made? And was there any particular reason why you didn't pre-sell them and why you just wanted to make the order and, and then go from there? Yeah, sure. So our initial investment was around 15000 for the first batch of planners. and Which was how many, sorry? Uh, we got 2000 made up for the first lot. So... Mm-hmm. The reason we didn't pre-sell them is because, honestly, we knew nothing about business and how business worked, and we didn't realize that pre-selling was such a big thing. <laughs> <laughs> so, we essentially got them sent over, received them in October, and just started selling them once we received them. So, And I guess the other reason we didn't pre-sell them was we, frankly, didn't have the time as well. Yeah. Um, from conception to receiving was a crazy six months so and we were still working at the time as well Mm -hmm. and so that was not even really a thought so yeah we received them and then we didn't really have a choice we kind of had to sell them from there yeah so all right so you've got your fifteen thousand dollars out of pocket you've got two thousand planners in boxes lying around your apartment i'm guessing in in melbourne australia so what did you do then? How did you actually market them and sell sell that first batch? Yeah, man. So it was a combination of so many different things, testing, trial and error, and it's safe to say that most of them didn't work. So a few things that didn't work were reaching out to yoga studios in Melbourne who would want to sell them on consignment. Mm-hmm. And... Alex reached out to around 50 yoga studios to want to sell them on consignment. Two of them said yes. Mm. We reached out to bookstores and university bookstores and none of them wanted to sell our planner. We hit up marketing agencies and corporate offices to see if they wanted to buy batches for their clients or for their staff for Christmas gifts, etc. Mm-hmm. And none of them, none of them wanted to buy any, so it was pretty disheartening. Um, we thought we'd be able to just print them up and then they'd sell like that, but unfortunately, that's not how it happened. Yeah. And other things we did was hitting up workshops and wellness spaces and these kind of things that were in line with our brand values. And again, most of those didn't work. But the one tactic that did work for us, and I discussed this on Noah, with Noah as well, was sending copies to micro influencers whether that be someone in in our case which is a health and wellness type niche with not a million followers not a hundred thousand followers but five thousand followers or ten thousand followers mm-hmm. because those people still have a really engaged audience but they often don't receive a lot of free stuff for one so when they do they're stoked to share it with their audience mm-hmm. and they often will be more than happy to give out their address for you to send it to them. So we kind of sent out probably around 100, I think it was, to these micro-influencers with no obligation to share. And mm-hmm. I'd say a lot of them did. I think maybe even half of them did. We, it's hard. We didn't really keep numbers, but that worked really well for us. And a lot of those people we've built relationships with and we're still friends with to these days. So um, mm-hmm. to this day, sorry. So... That was a really awesome tactic, which worked well from us. And then from that point, you can start targeting the kind of next level. So the people with 20,000 or 50,000 and Mm. go up from there rather than starting at your million followers or whatnot. So 
that was one tactic which worked really well. And another would have been Alex's marketing um, skills that she learned at her agency helped us rank quite well for the term 2018 diary in our first year. Mm. So we were coming up on a lot of Google searches, which was great. Amazing. And throughout the selling period, general things like building an email list, marketing on Instagram and Facebook, and obviously just using our available network, our friends and family, um, and just general things that you would, uh, you'd probably want to do for most businesses mm-hmm. were, were keys for us. Yeah, that's awesome, man. I love the uh, the micro influ- influences. It's such a a good idea because influencer marketing is is obviously quite big at the moment. But a lot of people assume, as you said at the start, it's your your one million or your hundred thousand influencers that you think you need to get the product in their hand. But a lot of those people charge a lot of money, and and you can argue whether it's worth it but then as you said you target those 2000 followers 5000 followers is still a lot of people if they're an engaged audience so if you can if you can get the product in front of those people then that's that's amazing yeah and exactly right it's it's such a risk i think as well influencer marketing especially the paid ones because you could shove out $5000 on an influencer sharing something and you really can't guarantee any return so at, to this day, we don't really participate in any paid influencer marketing uh, for reasons which I guess don't really align with our brand. Um, mm-hmm. Some other brands do it and they absolutely kill it and that's awesome for them, but it's not really something that we participate in. So definitely those yeah. micro-influencers uh, was the awesome. way to go for us. Yeah, it seems like it worked well. Did you find it... Because a lot of people... You mentioned hitting up your your friends and family. A lot of people forget that part of it when they when they have a product or a business. They they wonder how how can I get all this cold traffic and convince them to buy this product and and convert all those people that don't even know who I am. But they forget about the friends and family who already know and trust you. So was that did you think of that straight away or like were you worried about trying to sell to your family or what was your thought process there? Yeah, that was something I got from Noah as well. It was really asking the question, well, how many Facebook friends do you have? How many colleagues do you have? How many friends and family do you have? And you add these numbers up and you you start having a few hundred. Mm -hmm. And obviously not everyone's going to buy from you, but there's going to be a few people that will. And even if they don't particularly love the product and they might not have purchased it if it wasn't you selling it, it's still great for those initial first sales because it gets your confidence up, it gets some money coming in. And so Mm -hmm. anyone who's starting anything, whether it be a service-based business or e-commerce or whatnot, definitely reaching out to your friends and family first is such a great uh, first step because our first sale was one of my mates and it was not a mate I'm super close with, but um, I don't catch up with him often, but we put a, Facebook post out when we first launched and that an hour later, the Shopify notification went off and I was like, Oh my God, you know, lucky you bought one. <laughs> so it was a really cool feeling that your mates can help you out and support you. Yeah. I love it. And so it seems like you got quite a lot of press as well. I don't know if this was maybe the first batch or later on, but there's a lot of blogs like Business Insider featured you. You were featured on Side Hustle School, uh, Afternoon Pick Me Up, A Girl in Progress, All About Planners. Like a ton of, of people wrote about you and featured you. So how did all that press come about? Was that just cold reaching out to people and, and pitching the product or how did that work? Yeah, a bit of both. So Business Insider came about from, it was actually an affiliate um, marketing link so we thought we'd try affiliate marketing this year and it didn't really work that well for us so that's how that came about the other ones you mentioned are just contacts that alex has reached out to a lot of them are in melbourne just caught up with a coffee and then became friends with so a lot of them are people we know personally and are happy to share about our brand and in terms of our press a lot of our press i think comes from 
sending out free copies to blogs and especially to gift guides and bloggers who will make a compilation of the best kind of planners and diaries for the year. So a lot of people will be searching for so many planners and diaries out there, obviously. So a lot of people will search for the blog posts, which has them all yeah. prepared and they can make their choice from there. So um, we always want yeah. to try and be in as many of those as possible. Yeah. Makes total sense. Did you, so there's a lot of work to, to sell this, these planners initially and get the ball rolling on that. Did you expect that? Because if you told a lot of people that they had to reach out to hundreds of yoga or 50 yoga studios, reach out to bookshops, reach out to corporates, post on Instagram, do all this stuff. Like it's a lot of work. Did you expect that going in or were you kind of just, I guess, a bit naive in terms of how much effort it would take to, to sell these planners initially? Yeah, hundred percent. We were totally naive. <laughs> it was, it was one of those learning curves, which is really valuable and something that we look back on and we're super glad that we went through, but there was definitely, I think, I can't remember who said it, but you've got to have a certain amount of naive optimism when you're starting a business or you're doing any kind of venture, which is a lot bigger than anything you've done before. So we certainly had a lot of that and learned a lot along the way, which was really good. But yeah, absolutely, man. For some reason, just like my drum samples, I thought they'd sell themselves. <laughs> and <laughs> but it's up to you to get the ball rolling first. Yeah, such a key point. I think because Sam Belford, obviously, the, the curation planner that you have is, is a great product and a lot of people love it. And but it's not enough to just have a great product initially. You've got to actually do the work and sell it. It's a great product is like the entry point. Then you got to sell it, which sounds like you did a really great job of. So I love it. So <clears throat> I was curious, did you, were you literally packing orders out of your, your St. Kilda apartment initially, or did you have a fulfillment warehouse or how did that work? And are you still, what are you doing now in terms of fulfillment? Yeah, so both our 2018 planner and our 2019 planner, we've fulfilled ourselves out of our apartment. Mm -hmm. And so the first year was very manageable. Last year was hectic because <laughs> we <laughs> tri obviously tripled our revenue and tripled our order and whatnot. So um, it got a bit beyond a one-bedroom apartment and <laughs> drove us a bit crazy knowing that when you wake up in the morning, you are waking up to a sea of planners and boxes everywhere. <laughs> but yeah, we do, we do do all the fulfilling ourselves. We probably still will continue doing it. Um, there are a lot of advantages of doing fulfillment yourself. Um, one being costs. So our process is pretty quick now. The packaging we use is really quick, so we can smash out a lot of orders very quickly. Um, we can offer faster shipping to our customers, which customers really appreciate. And our quality control, we can obviously see if there's any major defects before they get sent out. So they're probably the main reasons. Oh, and we do gift notes as well. We have done in the past and mm -hmm. sending just a nice note to a customer, which is handwritten. So they're mm -hmm. kind of the reasons we did fulfillment ourselves and probably still will continue to do fulfillment for ourselves for the meantime. But mm -hmm. we are definitely getting a house this year with a garage. <laughs> <laughs> Makes sense. Don't blame yeah. me. <laughs> it's good that you're uh, you're in business with your partner because if if your partner wasn't in on it, I think they'd they'd be less less tolerant of having the boxes stacked up everywhere. So Absolutely. It's good. <laughs> no, it's good. Um, so one thing I was curious about as well because you, in terms of when you first started designing the product. There's, you made this a specific dated planner, so it's, you had your 2018 and your 2019, now obviously you're going to have the 2020 planner. That's, that's a harder sell because if you can't sell the planners then, and the year starts, you're kind of stuck with them in a way. So did you give any consideration to that of maybe we should make this more generic and not dated or was it again just a case of the product I want is a yearly planner and then we'll just figure it out. Like, what was your thought process there? Yeah, it was definitely more the latter. We honestly didn't even consider a non 
dated planner, for example, just again, due to our own naivety, I think it would be, but the product that Alex wanted was a dated planner as well. So for those reasons, we've always gone dated. We've been considering doing a non-dated one potentially, but we'll, we're not sure at this stage whether we that's something we're going to entertain. But for the meantime, we're going to stick with dated. I think customers like uh, a fresh start for a new year and having a new planner kind of buys into the story a little bit as well. So that works well in terms of marketing. Yep. But... Yeah, for the moment, it'll yep. be dated. And to be completely honest with you, I did not consider a uh, undated, which sounds a lot safer than having something with an expiration date on it. <laughs> or you could argue, I guess, it gives you some urgency to sell. So it might, may not well, be that's a bad it. thing. <laughs> that's exactly right. It's forcing you to sell it. That's it. <laughs> and another thing I was curious about was so it's a. Am I right in saying it's around a $60 price point, roughly, for the, the planner? Is that kind of where you're at? That's seems, correct. It seems, yeah. yeah, cool. Perfect. Because it seems quite high for a, a diary, and I, I understand why, because there's a lot of a lot of stuff going on with this, this planner. It's definitely um, would be worth the money, but it's $60, because there's a bit above that point where it's like an impulse buy for a, for a customer, I feel like, so... I mean, again, was that just a case of you wanted to have all these features and this is what it's going to cost um, and you didn't really consider that price point or did you do any testing on pricing or have any thoughts there? Um, what was kind of the thought process with that? Yeah, sure. I love that you brought this up because it's a fascinating topic, pricing, especially mm-hmm. online pricing. So mm-hmm. something that I borrowed from Seth Godin was the concept of price is a story. So at our price point of fifty nine ninety five, we are willing to exclude ninety five percent of people looking for a planner. Mm-hmm. So the five percent of people who would purchase from us, for example, would feel better about their purchase, about paying fifty nine ninety five for a said Belford planner than paying fifteen dollars for a planner from Officeworks, because mm-hmm. that's what they desire. So. Alex and I decided from the beginning that we wanted to be premium in terms of features, in terms of quality, and in terms of our customer service as well. Mm-hmm. And along with that comes a premium price as well. Um, it's, I guess it's not too premium in terms of there are planners out there which are three figures, which I think are a bit over the top. But um, And then... I guess the other reason was a lot of our quote-unquote competition were selling around the $30, $40 mark. So to stand out from them, we can either sell cheaper or more expensive. Mm -hmm. We chose more expensive. So from there, we could offer free shipping and we could donate a percentage of our profits to the mental health charities that you mentioned at the start as well. Um, Mm -hmm. And then I guess like the challenges in terms of a high price though is customers have obviously high expectations. <laughs> so they're less forgiving of small defects, for example, of slow shipping, for example. So, you know, we take the burden of Oz post on our hands. <laughs> and so, so those kind of things are the challenges of, of pricing high, but we, at the end of the day, we didn't test it at all. We decided 59.95 from the start. Yeah. And it's you're right in the sense that it's certainly not an impulse buy. And, you know, the analytics are fascinating because customers love shopping around for planners. They'll, they will shop for two months before they make a purchase. And we'll see the analytics that this customer has come back to our site 11, 13, 15 times and wow. has converted after two months. So wow. people out there really do their research. So that's really cool to see. Um, but we certainly don't regret pricing it the way we do. Yeah. No, it sounds like you got perfect kind of product market fit and, and pricing in terms of the level you're at. It just seemed to, to be the right, right point. So that's awesome. So one thing I was interested in about as well was, so you're, you and Alex have both been in, in jobs previously. You've both worked for other people. 
now you're on this this journey where you're you're working for yourself and you're kind of responsible for your own destiny i guess now and so i'd imagine that would take a lot more discipline and and just really being able to navigate that um would have its challenges i'm sure so have you got any thoughts on that of of how that's different and in terms of like the way you have to approach it and the mindset and any tips that you could pass on to to other people who might be going through that transition as well yeah totally dude this was i love this topic because i was super undisciplined growing up in my teens even in my early 20s i was really really lazy so i had to learn how to be disciplined um and that took a long time but I guess it was through a few resources. So reading books for starters and listening to podcasts, those two really helped. But working for yourself is a whole different ball game because you don't have anyone to kick your ass. And Alex can kick my ass and I can kick her ass. And that's a benefit. But if you're not lucky enough like us to have a partner or a friend who you work with, it's and you're not super self-disciplined, it is going to be pretty tough. But, I mean, how, how do you find it? Like, what resources have you used to stay disciplined for yourself? For me personally? Uh, yeah, it's a good question, man. Um, for me, I just... One thing that helps me is... I've kind of talked a bit about this before, is that I... Well, there's two... Okay, two things. So, one thing is having good habits... So trying to remove the decision-making process from doing things. So if I want to consistently work out and get fit, then that needs to become a habit. So I can work on creating that habit. Same with like, if I want to read more books, I need to, I'm not going to try and sit down and smash out a book once a week. I'm going to sit down and read 10 pages every day and do that consistently until it becomes a habit, you know? So having good habits helps a lot with discipline because it actually takes the discipline out of it essentially it goes on autopilot and then the other thing that helps me is I project sort of it's almost like a visualization exercise because I think to myself all right I could just sit on the couch and, and do nothing or I could do this thing that's a bit hard in the moment but long term what are those two trajectories going to look like what's my life going to look like in 10 years If I don't do the hard thing now, and if I take the easy route, it might be easy now, but in 10 years, it's going to be a lot harder and and worse. So kind of just visualizing, projecting out into the future of what that's going to look like is an exercise that helps me when I'm feeling that bit of unmotivation. So those are two things that help me. Yeah, dude, I love that one. You can use that one with food as well, because I, I can't remember where I heard this. A long time ago, I heard this, but if you think of food as a short, medium, long-term journey, yes. so short-term being within a couple of hours, oh, short-term being the moment you're eating it, medium-term being four to six hours after you eat it, and then long-term. So if you have a nourishing meal, sometimes it's not the best tasting meal, but the next four to six hours, you're going to feel energized. In the next five to 10 years, you're going to be healthy and vice versa. Absolutely. And so I, I love that thought. And one other thing that we do for discipline is set rules for ourselves. So I know you've got a morning routine. I have a morning routine as well. Um, mine's pretty similar to yours from what, I've, from what I've heard of yours. But And now I'm on the road at the moment. We're traveling around Southeast Asia for a bit. It's been a little bit off. It's been a bit hard to be disciplined when you're not in the same environment. But, yep. you know, it consists of having a, a boot on function where the first hour or two hours of your day, you don't have to make many decisions you can really go through the motions and get your day started and then use your decision making power for more important things like the work you need to do or the change you seek to make so yeah it's a topic that fascinates me and it's taken a lot of trial and error and i don't think um, it's going to work the same for everybody some people will have different paths but for me, definitely having rules for what I do for the first few things in the morning and having disciplines when it comes to food, when it comes to sleep as well, which is another big one. Mm-hmm. I mean, if we have six hours sleep one night, how's that going to affect the next day as opposed to if we had eight hours sleep? You know, it's going to be a big mm-hmm. difference for someone like me who can't function off six hours sleep. So 
just getting yeah. to know yourself, getting to know your body and your bad habits, and then morphing that into how you can progress and how you can move forward, knowing all that information. Yeah, makes total sense. And yeah, they're, they're great tips. So I love that. So you in 2018, you hit $150,000 revenue uh, for the business, which is which is great because it's, it's just you, you and your partner Alex in the business. So your your overheads are minimal. It's really just the product costs and some marketing costs. So that's that's great growth for for a young business. So what's your plans for St. Belford? Where do you want to take this in the next twelve months and beyond? Really? Yeah, it's a really good question. It's something we've been mulling over for the last three or four months and trying to figure out what the next step is. Obviously, 2020 is around the corner. You know, we're talking, we're recording this in May, but before we know it, it's going to be September and before we know it, it's going to be 2020. So we're getting our designs ready for obviously the 2020 season, but long-term, we're still trying to figure out what we want to do with St. Belford, the direction we want to take St. Belford in. People love the product, which is the only product we have, which is curation. And we've got a couple of accessories as well, but the, this, the core product curation, people love it, which is amazing. Mm-hmm. So we're going to keep working with that and keep improving that. But in terms of what's next for St. Belford, it's just a matter of providing as much value and content as possible. We're using this off-season to really work on ourselves, work on our blog, work on content we can produce for our audience. And it's really just trying to figure out the next step, whether we go new products, whether we go Mm service-based. So long story short, we we don't really know. (laughs) We do have have larger goals in terms of what we want to do and how many planners we want to sell, which is great. But... um, in terms of new products and that kind of thing, we're not entirely sure yet, dude. It will be a mystery until we figure out something which is as unique as curation. A lot of people have prompted us and said, hey, we'd love to see you make a journal. And that's something we've been thinking about for a long time, but there's so many awesome journals out there. And I really think one reason curation succeeded was because it was so different. And Mm. we don't really want to force a product just because people are asking us to make it. No one asked us to make curation and it worked and we wanted to do it. So it's just kind of working through that and we do, we believe the answer will come. <laughs> it's just yeah. asking the question, waiting for the answer to come. Ha, I love it. And yeah, sometimes it's better. Sometimes if you have too rigid, I guess, goals or directions, it can kind of blind you to opportunity. So as long as you're kind of keeping your eyes open and, and looking for those opportunities, then I'm sure uh, it'll come to you. So I love that. Well, sort of coming up on the, the end of the interview here, but I just want to know, is there, is there anything I haven't asked you or anything that you just really want to make sure that you pass on to the audience here today before we finish up here, Thomas? Um, not really, dude. I am always super humble and super grateful when people email me and ask questions especially from Noah's podcast a lot of people reached out and just asked questions and said hey I want to start a business I want to do this I want to do that so I'm really happy to provide help in that area we're still learning we're still growing I'm sure you feel the same like still kind of have no idea what we're doing but we're working it out as we go along so we certainly not, don't feel that we're experts in the area. We're a super small business. We've had a little bit of success, but uh, we're taking it one day at a time. And we're not trying to grow too rapidly either. So we're just slow and steady wins the race, I guess you could say. <laughs> but yeah, if anyone wants to reach out and ask any specific questions around business or anything like that, please reach out. Um, I'm sure you'll pop my email in the show notes. Yeah, absolutely. And just for the people listening, the Noah that Thomas is referring to is Noah Kagan. And Thomas was featured on his podcast recently, which is how I came to hear about you as well. So um, that, was, that was a great interview you can check out as well. But yeah, last question really, Thomas, is just what's the best way for people to connect with you if they do want to reach out and, and ask 
for your advice on business or just thank you for coming on the show and or just say good day what's what's the best way to do that yeah sure so i have a personal website which is the number one then the letters omas.com so one omas.com which is a terrible domain to verbally <laughs> explain <laughs> but i'm stuck with it now um or you can go check out St. Belford at St. Belford, all spelled out, S-A-I-N-T-B-E-L-F-O-R-D.com.au. And we're going to be releasing some new products in September. So come check us out then. But yeah, feel free to hit me up. And I'm on Instagram at one on as well. Awesome. Well, Thomas, thank you for, for coming on the show today. It was really fascinating to, to pick your brains and see exactly how you how you grew this business it's it's really cool it's you were kind of unhappy in your your work life and looking for for something on the side and and then the way you sort of came up with this idea and brought it to life with your partner Alex and the process you went through and and really the the great growth you've had in just a few few short years and which I'm sure will continue and as well as the other kind of social enterprise side of the business that you're, you're doing supporting a lot of great initiatives in terms of mental health and which obviously came from from uh, from Alex's experience in, in her own corporate career. So, yeah, uh, Thomas, thank you very much for, for coming on the show today. I appreciate you coming. Thanks, James. I appreciate you having me, dude. And it was awesome to hear an Aussie accent because I've been overseas for about two months and haven't been able to speak to many Australians. So it's good uh-huh. to have a taste of back home. <laughs> yeah. And make sure you let me know when you come back to Melbourne so we can go get a, a coffee. <laughs> <laughs> Let's do it, man. I'm keen. Awesome. All right, well, thanks everyone for listening to the show today. Make sure you go check out Thomas and St. Belford. We'll link all that up in the show notes so you can find that easily and have a great day. All right, thanks everyone so much for listening to the interview with Thomas today. I hope you got a lot of value from it. And I've just got a real quick favor to ask if you've made it this far on the podcast. If you're listening on Apple Podcasts on iTunes, if you can please leave me a rating and review on Apple Podcasts, that would mean the world to me. And the reason for that is because It really helps grow the show audience and gives the show more credibility when there's a lot of reviews and ratings and helps in the ranking. So that would help me so much if you could do that. And if you're not using an iOS device, if you're say listening on Spotify, for example, you can still help me out if you screenshot your your phone when you're listening to the, the episode and then post it on your Instagram stories, tag me in it. Doing anything like that to share the show and help more people discover it would mean the world. So Thanks again for listening and have a great day.